So we are on day 20 of 20, yes, day 20 of our Bible in a Year series. And today we're going to be covering Exodus chapters 10, 11, and 12. Pharaoh finally breaks and he's going to, he's considering, he thinks, I want these people out of my land. So before we get into it, let's pray really quick. Spirit of the living God, Lord, I just thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to study your word and your open door policy that we can just come to your throne whenever we want to. Lord, I pray that you just open our eyes, ears, and minds so that we can read and interpret your word as you have intended for it to be interpreted. Father, I pray that you bless each and every single person participating in this Bible study series and that you open their understanding so that way they can apply your word to their daily lives. I pray these things in the mighty name of your son Jesus amen okay let's get started so okay so we are starting with chapter 10 so then Moses no so then the Lord said to Moses go to Pharaoh for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials so that I may do these miraculous signs of mine among them now I want to stop right there really quick because I think it's really important to know that the reason that Pharaoh refuses to let these people go, it has everything to do with the fact that God has hardened his heart. This is not something that he would have ordinarily done. It's because God has hardened his heart. And God has hardened his heart because his glory is going to be magnified. Pharaoh is not the only person that is afflicted, but the entire region of Egypt is afflicted. And during this time, Egypt was not the size it is now it was larger it was more of like a territorial a territorial space it was much larger so people throughout the entire land of egypt they are under the rule under the rule of pharaoh they knew they understood that the wrath of the god of the hebrews the the god of abraham this was his doing and so his name was known throughout the land through these wraths and so this is the main reason why they were, why his heart, why the, his heart was hardened. So he says, and so that you may tell your sons and, okay, let's go back here because I got ahead a little bit. He says, he says, so go to Pharaoh for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials so that I may do these miraculous signs of mine among them. And so that you may tell your sons and grandson how severely I dealt with the Egyptians and performed miraculous signs among them. And you will know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and told him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? And when I read that, the first thing that came to my mind is, how often do like how 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 often do we bring affliction onto ourselves by the refusal to humble ourselves before God? Pride, like we're all pride is a huge category. When we think of pride, because the opposite of humility, which is you know where hum, hum, being humble comes from, is the root of humility. So pride is a category. You have people that exalt themselves in their physical appearance, their mental capacity, how um, their spiritual abilities. You have people, there's a spiritual arrogance. There's different types of pride. And so how often have we exalted ourselves in any capacity and been afflicted because of it, but we refuse to bring ourselves in a lowly place because we know that God has a heart for those that uh, for the humble and meek. Okay, I promise we're going to get through this. Okay, so let my people go that they may worship me. But if you refuse to let my people go, then tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory and they will cover the surface of the land so that no one will, ab will be able to see the land. They will eat the remainder left that you have escaped, that you uh, that escaped the hell. And you remember um, in the last, uh, yesterday, uh, where the one of the plagues, the hell that came through, they had destroyed all of the crops that were already um that were already up and flowered and bloomed but the ones that they had not destroyed were the ones that were still like that had not yet come up and grown out yet but now that so time has passed and now those are up now and god has come back through to fully devastate him he's not like he's not leaving any stone unturned so he's wiping out everything and he was patient enough to wait for them to get a little bit of something it's kind of like um like the edge of um breakthrough the edge of breakthrough and that's something like um that you see a lot of when you see you're dealing with warfare you'll get right to the edge of almost getting something done and then it's taken away from you like that or you like you're going for a job interview and everything goes well and on your first day suddenly 
they don't know they no longer need you it's the edge of breakthrough so this kind of reminds me of that okay he says but if you refuse to let my people go then tomorrow i will bring locusts to your territory they will cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land they will eat the remainder of what you have left except to escape the hell they will eat every tree you have growing in the fields they will fill your houses <coughs> all your official houses and the houses of all the Egyptians, something your fathers and grandfathers never saw since the time they occupied the land until today. Then he turned and left Pharaoh's presence. Now, I want to point out that that um, Ser Serapia is the Egyptian deity that, that is known to protect from lo locusts. That's actually what this deity's job is, to is a protector of from locusts protects from locusts so essentially at this time it seems that locusts were a serious problem and this deity protected from them and so this is god essentially defeating that deity okay we are on verse seven so pharaoh's officials asked him how long must this man be a snare to us now the word snare means trap so how long must this man be a trap to us let the men go so that they, they may worship the Lord, their God. Don't you realize that Egypt is devastated? And I want to point this out right here because so many times we, sometimes we're oppressed spiritually. We're, uh, we are oppressed physically. We have different types of oppressors and different types of oppression, but specifically, specifically spiritual oppression when you're being, um, you're the victim of targeted, um, of the targeted victim of witchcraft or occultic um, things, or just in general, any type of thing, generational curses, any type of affliction you're dealing with. Whenever God steps in on the scene, we all, we often think we, we have this, this image in our head. So let's use Pharaoh, for example, the the Israelites have been oppressed for so long. Let's say that they don't see Pharaoh on his throne. They just they don't even really see him. They see like his his people, and so they think Pharaoh's in his throne and his in his his palace being fed grapes by belly dancers and like living this very lavish life. But his land is devastated, and that's because God comes up. He shows up on the scene, and so sometimes even when it seems like nothing's happening. God is working in the background. You have no idea what your oppressors are going through. You have no idea what those that afflicted you, you have no idea what they're going through. You have no idea. And this uh, verse just really just kind of reminded me of that. Egypt is devastated. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. Go worship the Lord your God, Pharaoh said. But exactly who will be going, Pharaoh said. Moses replied, we will go with our young and with our old. We will go with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds, our, our herds because we must hold the Lord's festival. Verse 10. So he said to them, the Lord would have to be with you if I were to ever let you, go, you and your families go. Look out, you're headed for trouble. No, go. Just, just able-bodied men worship the Lord since that's what you want and they were driven from Pharaoh's presence. So he was not even willing to let them all go. He's very selective. You can take these people, but not all of them. So the Lord then said to Moses, stretch out your hand over Egypt, over the land of Egypt, and the locusts will come up and eat every plant in the land, everything the hell left. So Moses stretched out his, his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord sent an east wind over the land all that day and throughout and through the night. And by the morning, the east wind had brought in the locusts. The locusts went up over the entire land of Egypt and settled on the whole territory of Egypt. Again, this is a territory, so it's a it's a region. So never before had there been such a great uh, such a large number of lo of locusts. There never will be again. They covered the surface of the whole land so that the land was black. Could you imagine that? Like there were so many of these creatures, so many of these insects that the entire land was black. Like they couldn't see anything at all. Okay. Okay. Here we are right here. And they consumed all the plants on the ground and all the fruits on the trees that the hell had left. And nothing green was left on the trees or the plants in the field throughout the land of Egypt. Now Pharaoh urgently sent for Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. And he said urgently, like because he was desperate at this point because his entire land had been devastated because of what had happened. He said, please forgive me and my sins once more and make an appeal to the Lord your God so that he will just take this death away from me. 
Moses left Pharaoh's presence and appealed to the Lord. And then the Lord changed the wind to a strong, to a strong west wind. And it carried off the locusts and blew them into the Red Sea. Now you notice he said, take this death off of me. Pharaoh said, take this death off of me. Okay, so we are here at, uh, right here. Not a single locust was left in the territory of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the Israelites go. And God was being patient with Pharaoh, like he really was. Okay. So the ninth plague, darkness. Now the ninth plague, I want to point this out really quick before I forget, um, is it, it's a de, it's defeat, the defeation. Is it defeation? No. It's the, basically the defeat of the Egyptian sun gods. I'm sorry, I'm tired and I've not um, had enough caffeine today. So defeation is definitely not a word. Defeation. Depletion is a word, but not defeation. My goodness. Okay, Egyptian sun gods. So you have like re- you have Re, you have Amon Re, you have A10, that's A T E N, you have A Tum, that's A T U M, and you have Horus, and then you have Thoth, the Egyptian moon god. And there are a few others as well, but these are just the ones that I was able to um, I was able to find. Okay. And these are not gunshots that you guys hear. It's the fourth of July right now, and people are popping fireworks right now, so these are not gunshots. Okay. So then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards heaven and there will be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was this, there was thick darkness throughout the land of Egypt for three days. One person could not see another and for three days they did not move from where they were. Yet all the Israelites had light where they lived. And this was like, if you know, the entire land of Egypt was covered in darkness. However, where the Israelites were, there were, that was light. And if this is not the epitome of, I will bless you in the presence of your enemies. I will prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. They're struggling over here. Yet the Israelites who were oppressed are really thriving spiritually. Okay, Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, go worship the Lord. Even your families may go with you. Only your flocks and herds must stay behind. He's not wanting to let, he's just making it hard for him. Moses responded, you must also let us have sacrifices and burn offerings to prepare for the Lord our God. Even our livestock must go with us. Not a hoof will be left behind because we will take some of them to worship the Lord our God. We will not know what we will use to worship the Lord until we get there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was unwilling to let them go. Pharaoh said to him, leave me. Make sure you never see my face again, for, one, for on the day you see my face, you will die. As you have said, Moses replied, I will never see your face again. The tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. Now, this is a uh, basically the defeat of uh, several Egyptian gods. Um, you have Min, M-I-N which is a god of reproduction. You have Isis, which is the goddess of fertility. And you have Heket, which is the goddess of birth. And you have Pharaoh's son, who would be worshipped as a god. Okay, so the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one, one more plague on Pharaoh and, and on Egypt. And after that, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you out of here. And this right here tells us that just like this devil knows your price, like clearly, I mean, God knows your price. He knew exactly what it would take for Pharaoh to release these, release the Israelites into, to go and worship God. He knew exactly what it would take. God knew what it would take. But he, again, wanted to make his power known throughout the entire region, throughout the entire territory. Now announce to the people that both men and women should ask their neighbors for silver and gold items. The Lord gave the people favor with the Egyptians. In addition, Moses himself was very highly regarded in the land of Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and the people. So Moses said, this is what the Lord say, says, after midnight, I will go throughout, the, go throughout Egypt and every firstborn male in the land of Egypt will die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn of the servant girl who is uh, at the grindstones as well as the firstborn of every livestock. Then there will be a great cry of anguish throughout all the land of Egypt, such as never was before or ever will be again. But all against all the Israelites, whether people or animals, not even a dog will snarl. 
so that you may know that the Lord made makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these officials of yours will come down to me and bow before me, saying, Get out, you and all the people who follow you. After that, I will get out. And he went out from Pharaoh's presence, fiercely angry. The Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So again, this is God's doing. He's, these people are suffering for God's glory, but he has a, a large blessing on the other side of, the, uh, on the other side of that, that suffering. So Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go out of his land. Okay, so we're at chapter 12. Instruction for the Passover. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month is to be the beginning of months for you. It is the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel on the 10th day of this month, they must each select an animal of the flock according to their fam father's family, one animal per family. And if the fa household is too small for a whole animal, then that person and the neighbor nearest his house are to select one based on the combined number of people. You should apportion the animal according to what each will eat. You must make, you must have an unblemished animal, a year old male. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of the, um, of the month of this month. Then the whole assembly, uh, see, then the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the animals at twilight. They must take some of the blood and put it on two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat them. They are to eat the meat that night. They should eat it, roast it over, roast it over the fire along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or cooked in boiling water, but only roasted over fire, its head as well as its leg and inner organs. You must not leave any of it until morning. And this right here reminds me so much of how you don't have to, there's a reason for it. Well, here, let's, let me read through it first. So you must not leave any of it until morning. Any part of it left until the morning, you must burn. Now, here's how you must eat it. You must be dressed for travel, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. You are to eat it in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover. So he's basically saying, get ready, be ready. If, you, if you're already ready, you won't have to get ready. So stay ready. Stay ready. That's what I took from the stay ready. And he's saying, what you're eating for this moment, you, you, you're not going to take this to the next day. And I don't know if we got to that verse yet or not, but you're not going to take this till tomorrow. You're going to leave it here. Whatever you don't eat, you're going to burn. You're going to burn. You're not going to take anything from yesterday and bring it in today. I'm going to provide for you each and every single day. Okay, verse 12. So he says, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both people and animals. I am the Lord. I will execute judgment on all the gods of Egypt. The blood of the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day is to be a memorial for you and you must celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. You are to celebrate it throughout your generation as a permanent statue. You must eat unleavened bread for seven days. On the first day, you must remove yeast from your houses. Now, I want to stop right here for a second because we see here that God really talks about, uh, he really has this thing for um, this thing, this thing against yeast. And if you've ever made, like if you've ever made bread or anything like that, if you've ever made bread or uh, from scratch or anything like that, you would know that whenever you add yeast to the bread, hold on, whenever you add yeast to the bread, Typically the yeast per it's a very tiny amount. So you have like four cups of water, but you'll have like a teaspoon, like half a teaspoon of yeast. That's not four cups of water, four cups of flour, but you have like half a teaspoon or a teaspoon of yeast, and it's a very small amount in comparison to all the ingredients. But that yeast works and permeates through all of the all of the um, the dough and the bread and it causes it to expand. And so the yeast is uh, symbolic to sin. It's symbolic to sin. And so whenever we see unleavened bread, he's saying, leave that out. So essentially, and it's, it's a it's symbolism, leave that out. And we're just going to do this because let me read this to you really quick. Hold on. If we go to first Corinthians, let me find it. First Corinthians, I think it's right here. Hold on. 
if we go to first Corinthians, I think it's second. That's right here. Hold on. I know I made a mark of it somewhere. Bear with me. I have like little, I made like little notes here. I have to go find the note for this one. I'm, I'm recording this on a different computer and it's not really, it's not really doing what I want. Let me see if I can find the verse on this other computer. Oh. I've had so many computer issues trying to do this. Okay, it's 1 Corinthians 5, 6. I'm going to read it over here because I have it on this computer. It says, your blessing is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. He's talking about sin. Paul is talking about sin here. And so um, essentially, the yeast represents sin and corruption. So that's why he's saying unleavened bread, bread without yeast. And not just that, but you won't have to wait for it to rise. If you made bread, you would know that it take it takes several hours to uh, to rise and to, uh, to make. And a big part of that is you have to wait for the the dough to process it. So you have to let the sin, not sin, yeast permeate through it. Okay, I promise we're gonna get through this. I really wanted to make that point though because it was a good one. Okay, so. You are to hold a sacred assembly on the first day and another sacred assembly on the seventh day. No work may be done on those days except for preparing what people need to eat. You may do only that. You are to observe the festival of unleavened bread because on this very day I brought your military divisions out of the land of Egypt. You must observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent statute. You are to eat unleavened bread in the first month from the evening of the 14th day of the month until the evening of the 21st day. You must not be found in your houses. Yeast must not be found in your houses for seven days. And if anyone eats something leavened, that person, whether a, re a resident alien or a native of the land, must be, there we go, must be cut off from the community of Israel. Do not eat anything leavened. Eat un eat unleavened bread in all your homes. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go select an animal from the flock according to your families and slaughter the Passover animal. Take a cluster of hyssop, dip it in the, the blood that is in the basin, and brush the lentil and the two doorposts with some of the blood in the basin. Okay, let's get up here. None of you may go out the door of his house until morning when the Lord passes through to strike Egypt and sees the blood on the lentil and the two doorposts he will pass over the door and not let the destroyer enter your houses to strike you verse 24 keep this command permanently as a statue for you and your descendants when you enter the land the Lord that the Lord is giving you as he promised you are to observe the ceremony when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? You are to reply, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord. For he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and he spared our homes. So the people knelt low and worshiped. Then the Lord, then the Israelites went and did this. They did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. Okay. Now at midnight, the Lord struck every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn um, of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and every firstborn of the livestock. During the night, Pharaoh got up, he along with his officials and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud wailing throughout Egypt because there was a house, there wasn't a house without someone dead. He summoned Moses and Aaron during the night and said, get out immediately among my people from among my people, both you and the Israelites, and go worship the Lord as you have said. Take even your flocks and your herds, your herds, as as you asked, and leave, and also bless me. So he 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 does all this stuff, and then he like demands a blessing. He's like, leave, like you guys, you you've done enough damage here. Your God has no, done enough damage. Leave here and then bless me. That's funny. So now the Egyptians pressured the people in order to send them quickly out the country, for they said, we're all going to die. So the people took their dough before it was leavened with their kneading bowls wrapped up in their clothes on their shoulders. The Israelites 
acted on Moses' words and asked the Egyptians for silver and gold and for clothing. And the Lord gave the people such favor with the Egyptians that they gave them whatever they requested. In this way, they plundered the, the Egyptians. The Israelites traveled from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 able-bodied men on foot beside, besides their families. A mixed crowd also went up with them, along with a huge number of livestock, both flocks and herds. The people baked the dough they had bought, they had brought out of Egypt into unleavened loaves since it had no yeast. For when they were driven out of Egypt, they could not delay and had not prepared provisions for themselves. The time, the time that the Israelites lived in Egypt was 430 years. And at the end of the 430 years, on the same day, all the Lord's military divisions went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night vigil in honor of the Lord because he would bring out the land of Egypt. He would bring them out of the land of Egypt. Here we go. The same night in the honor of the Lord, a night vigil for all Israelites throughout the, their generations. Verse 43. This is a long chapter. So the Lord said to Moses, but we're getting through it. <laughs> the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the statue of the Passover. No foreigner may eat it, but any slave a man has purchased may eat it after you have circumcised him. A temporary, a temporary resident or hired worker may not eat and eat the Passover. It is to be eaten in one house. You may not take any of the meat outside the house, and you may not break any of its bones. The whole community of Israel must celebrate it. And if an alien resides among you and wants to observe the Lord's Passover, every male in his household let's see, where are we? must be circumcised, and then he may be, then he may participate. He will become like a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person may eat it. The same law will apply to both the native and the alien who resides among you. Then all the Israelites did this. They did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. On that same day, the Lord brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt according to their, um, their military divisions. And that is all we're going to cover today. So it's really dark in this room right now, too. And they are going off with these fireworks, my goodness. So... Let me know what, what type of revelation, what you got out of this. I really hope that you got something that, that God spoke to you in some capacity. One of the biggest things that really kind of um, resonated with me the most, I think one of the biggest revelations was, that, was how God deals with our oppressors behind closed doors. And we see that Egypt was devastated. That word just really stuck with me. Egypt was devastated. So as always, leave your comments. I love reading your comments. If you found this video helpful, give us a thumbs up. If you want to see similar content, subscribe. And I pray for you guys. I pray that you guys have a wonderful 4th of July and spend time with your family. And just I pray blessings over you guys. I will see you guys tomorrow. Blessings.